we are touched on the Shema, and the Shema is our word of witness, the Shema from Deuteronomy uh, 6 and 4, the Hear, O Israel, the Lord, our God, is one Lord, the Shema Yisrael, or the Hear, O Israel, and that's a, that's a word of witness. That's, that's a word of witness. That's basically what we say and what we declare to say that we are brothers and sisters and, and for the mothers, mothers of Christ. We're part of that family. When Christ said, who is my mother and my brothers? You understand? Those who, who hear the word of God and do it, in other words, those who seek to do the will of God. And that word of witness from ancient times even to the present time is a, 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 a central pillar. It's, it's a witness of our, of our faith. And it's known also within um, the Jewish and modern Jewish circles to be also a witness of the faith as well. Now, we want to touch on the five pillars of what we regard to be based on the, the evidence, the true Rastafari faith. Now, many of you might be familiar with some of the other um, some of the other presentations like previously. It comes down to boil down to basically three things in some of the other lists. We saw Sam Brown had I think about five points and other groups and people who investigate research Rastafari say that the Rastafarians they're about like um, four or five, maybe seven or so points that Rastafarians are agreed upon, people would say. And they say basically is that the black man is God. I'm going to boil it down to three. The black man is God. The white man is the devil. And return to Africa. That's usually, that's simplifying. That's just boiling down to its, its basic core curriculum. Now, in expanding, cascading, under the black man is God, we have Jah, we have the identification with the king, the king of kings, Kadamawi Haile Selassie of Ethiopia, the conquering line of the tribe of Judah. And um, Ethiopia comes under that, the black man is God, the king of kings, Ethiopia. And then sometimes ones might throw in the biblical Israelite kind of link or verse here or there. And then when we get to the white man's the devil, expanding on that, cascading that, the Babylonian system, we've been taken captive like the Israelites, so forth and so on. And then the third one is, is repatriation, or we have to um, come out of Babylon, which has been often interpreted from the physical level only to a physical return. And we've touched on this in other videos, but the basic teaching is this, that when we look at the word repatriation and we study the word, the word repatriation literally means to return to the parent, or more directly, it means to return to the father, return to the father. Now, Gnostically speaking, there's something very interesting that, that the early Christian Gnostics said. They said that the original sin wasn't so much just the fruit or whatever, but basically was ignorance. And the eating of the fruit as seen as a violation was disobedience. But the original sin was ignorance. The Valen, Valentinian, I think Valentius, expands on that particular theme, and he basically says that the Father was not known. The Father was not known. Now, if we look at the Gospels, the canonical gospels that we have here, even in translation, or if we go to more origination. You understand? Basically we find in the gospels that Christ, his mission or his purpose was to make the Father known. Everything in Christ refers to bearing witness to the Father. Bearing witness to the Father. Some have characterized it that when we were Hebrews or Old Testament so-called Jews, we were as orphans with our mother only, you understand, with Torah, with the law, with our mother, the, the two tables of law, the two breasts of our mother only. But in Christ, in the Moshiach, you understand, 
now we are restored into the family. You understand? The family of God. That's why John begins off, John's gospel speaks to us that, um, that how he came to his own and his own did not receive him, but as many of them who did, it says right here, he came to his own and his own received him not. His own did not Kabbalah him. His own did not Kabbalah. But as many as Kabbalah him, Kabbalah him, or received him, had a Mekabal of him, to them gave he power. That word power is not the Deuteronomy power. It is not the Hail power, but it's the Sultan, or to say, Sultane. Sultan is authority, and we expand that word Sultane. It links with what we have here, our divine heritage, right? Because Sultane means civilization. It's translated in the Ethiopic and in Ethiopian um, indigenous writings as referring to civilization, Sultane. But the root of it, Masultan. It means to be proficient. It has the idea of being proficient, really authority to rule. Literally, it means authority to rule. So when we look at that Ethiopic Afro-Shemitic word, sultan and sultani, this is where we get the word sultan. You might hear the word sultan. What is a sultan? A sultan is a type of Middle Eastern sort of ruler. You probably recall the Arabian Nights and those kind of tales. But there's a link there, but if we want to get to the root of it, we have to get to the root of our language and study our language. And the study of our language, our pure language, in the Ethiopic language, we come to that root. So that power that was given to them was authority to become what? To become the Bane Ha Elohim. It was authority to become the children of God. This is the key. You cannot become a true child of God apart from that authority. There must be that authorization. You know, like if you don't get authorization, even in the world today, you don't have access to certain things. You need to get that authorization, or you need to find the Bala Sultan. You need to find the Bala, the owner or the Lord of the Sultan, the one who owns that authority, or the one who is authorized that can give you authorization to do this or to do that. And the same is true, especially is true, you understand, when we now consider our holy covenant, the Al Kidan, as once lost but now found Beta Israel, or as Ethiopian Hebrews collectively, and particularly as elect Ras Tefari. It says, even to them that believe, my men, that exercise faith, amen, on his name. So it also brings into this context, in this, in this bigger discussion and reasoning that we're having on our name and nationality and birthright. You know what I'm saying? You'll see how these connect. You understand how these connect very intimately. So when you stop looking at the Bible so-called in a false pseudo-religious sense, or pseudo-religious sense, or through a Gentile, white, Western misinterpretation, and you put matters in its proper orientation, you look to the East, you put matters in its proper orientation, then it becomes very clear. You understand the, the keys, you understand the keys to our true freedom and liberation are in our hands, and they must be in our heads and our hearts so that our hands will be guided correctly. Verse 13 says, Which were born, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God, but of Ha Elohim, Baruch of Egizi Aviher, Lotu Subhat, to him be the praise. So these are not those who are born. In other words, it's not speaking about regular or first birth. Let's call it first birth. It's not speaking of first birth. You understand? Because when we're first born, we're either born of, of, of blood, you know, of, of a blood lineage, you know, to our ancestors, mother, father, so forth and so on, mitochondrial DNA, was that the Nor of the will of the flesh. 
you know, the will of the flesh that our mama and papa, they had some lust or animal attraction in a sense. They, they desired one another and they, you know, did it and that conceived us. Now, what happened after that, that's another matter. But the fact is, that explains the will of the flesh, the desire of the flesh, nor of the will of man. A man or a woman can say, I want to have a child. So they purposely go out there to either impregnate or to get pregnant, and they have a child, and hopefully that meets their, their will, their desire, what they desire. But, but this sort of birth that we're speaking about now, this true divine heritage, our divine heritage rebirth, is not limited to any of those things. So therefore, this is not speaking. So here in the scripture in verse 13, it's exempting those things. It's saying that this type of birth is not on that wise. And here it speaks in verse 14 of, some say, the incarnation. What is the incarnation? The incarnation explains it right here. It says, and the word, the logos, was made flesh. And the logos, the word, which is, which is immaterial, took on materiality or abided in the, the carbon construct we call the body, flesh, so forth and so on, and dwelt amongst us. And we beheld his glory, his Shekinah, his Shekinah, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of what? Of grace and truth. You know, you hear a lot of folks talking about grace. A lot of Christians, they talk about grace. Grace, 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 grace. And many of them say it's by grace, not by works. Well, no, it's, it's, it, it's, it is by works at the next level. Initially, they're correct. It is by grace that we have this opportunity. But once we have received, once we Kabbalah, Ebele, this, this grace, you understand, know it is incumbent upon us to work out our salvation. You understand? Know Otherwise, our faith that we declare is not living, but it's a dead faith. And that's where you get into your religiosity and your religios only. This, this is the, the bad interpretation or the bad application of so-called religion, which is commonly known and, and um, you know, bemoaned on and, and because of. So we have grace and truth. He was not just full of grace, but he was full of truth. He was full of the two truths, grace and truth. Grace, which means uh, unmerited, you know, favor. You know, grace, when you get grace, that means you, you really have no right to it, but one who is able to bestow it, willingly bestows it, you understand, even though one has no right to it, you understand, has no... No, they have no right, they can't buy it, they can't purchase it, it's beyond them. You understand, like if somebody gave you, to put it in a materialistic sense, if somebody gave you a million dollars, just it is, they saw your name in the phone book, they gave you a million dollars. No, no strings attached, no nothing. That's a sense of grace, but in this terminology, biblical terminology, grace, that, see, that's termino that sense is what the church teaches you, the money sense. But the real sense is like this. It's, it's that you've done some crime or you're convicted of doing some crime. Maybe you didn't know the law. You were ignorant of the law. But what they tell you in court, they tell you in court that ignorance of the law is no excuse. You say, yo, I didn't even know this was a law. I didn't even know doing this was a crime. The judge will say, I, 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 I hear what you're saying, but ignorance of the law is no excuse. Now, the judge can then say, you know what, I've been looking over your case, or here's how they say, I've been reviewing your case, Mr. and Mrs. So-and-so. And, -so. and um, I've decided, you know, I've decided to give you grace. I I've decided to show you mercy. The court can show mercy. That word mercy and grace, same thing. The principle being mercy triumph over judgment. But there must be judgment. Now, please don't confuse brothers and sisters and disciples. Don't confuse judging with condemnation. See, judging is a process. The process can render either a condemnation or a justification or an acquittal, in other words. 
See, a lot of folks, they read in the Bible, and they read in the Bible where it says, Thou shalt not judge. And anytime somebody says, I don't think that is right. Oh, you can't judge. That's a misapplication. That's a mis that should be thrown out of court. It should be thrown out of heart and mind and pay no attention when people say that. Because what Christ was saying, if you really study it, he was saying, do not condemn. Do not condemn. You have to be able to weigh things for yourself. And so what we have now is a whole generation, a whole ignoramus and lost generation that are told that they can't judge anything. So they have to accept everything as it is. So Satan's world system is just seeming to ride so pompously. You understand? You know, it's just going on with that and in that particular vein. But what Christ said when he says, do not judge, you understand? If you read it and study it, and I don't care if you, you could go to the Septuagint Greek, you could go to the New Hebrew versions of it, you can go to the, the Amharic, you can, you know, but go to one of the original languages, one of the Afro-Shemitic languages, or at least even go to the uh, uh, Mediterranean language that's between the two, and that's your coin of Greek, and you will find that it does not mean not to weigh and balance things because we, we, we make judgments all day. We have to. You know, you're about to walk across the street. You don't just keep walking and say, I hope no car hit me. I hope no car hit me. No, you're going to look, and you say, okay, that car is halfway down the block. I can make it over here. There's no other car. So if, if you were not to judge, you just walk across the street. And I think a lot of people are taking that really seriously. That's why we're hearing about these kind of crazy stuff going on. And you'd be like, how come the person did not look before they leap? Because they were told, don't judge. Just go along with it because you don't want to hurt nobody's feeling or whatever else like that. And still saying, no, that's not for me. No, I'm not with that. They said no is a very powerful word that we don't use it as we should. A lot of things that we just don't judge, we should judge and say, no, that's not for me. That don't mean you're condemning it. That means that you're making a value statement that, because, see, if you condemn something, notice this, that means either you have the power or you would like the power to impose a judgment or a sentence if you condemn. You understand? If you condemn. And even if you don't have that power, you already do it in your heart and your mind. So what Christ was telling his disciples at, at, at that that like an orientation. When you read in the Bible what stage of his ministry that was, that was an orientation. He was saying, stop being so condemnatory. You, you know what I mean? It's like a lot of us as black folks. Let me speak about as myself, as a so-called quote-unquote black folks. I'm using this limitedly. That's not my nationality. You understand? Um, that's not my birthright. You, you know what I mean? But I'm using it in a limited sense. But as black people, ones would say, you know, we'll judge other black people very harshly. A lot of us don't want, we'll say we have a reason for it. Even if that person didn't do us any wrong, it's because somebody else who seems like them have done so. So we prefer to be on the so-called safe side, condemn somebody who didn't do nothing wrong against us but condemn them in our heart and our mind. Though we are weak and, 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 and um, impotent to carry out any judgment, you know? That's what Christ, Christ was saying, get out, of that, get out of that condemnatory behavior. So the whole do not judge thing, that's in the Bible. You hear so many folks, people don't even believe in Jesus, don't believe in God, don't believe in the Bible. They'll pick that up and say, even Jesus Christ said don't judge. And then a lot of you Christian folks say, oh, that's true. And, and, and it's, it's almost like a spell. It's like magic. You understand? You don't pursue the point and say, hey, wait, 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 wait. What right do you have to pick up God's word and sling them back at me? Seeing you don't even believe in God or Jesus or Bible or anything. You know what I mean? But you would think to do that would be condemning. If they did that, doing that would be the only justifiable, get the word, justifiable response. And if you don't respond that way, you've allowed the evildoers to trample on your rights and even pre prevent you from fulfilling the will of the God and Father and Jesus Christ who you say, you understand, you are loyal to. You see what I'm saying? You're, that's why the Bible says that anyone who seeks to live godly will suffer, you know, will suffer persecution. 
You know what I mean? Or anyone who's, anyone who seeks to do the will of John. You know, there's, there's going to be difficult days. There's going to be, you know, there's going to be challenges. There's, but, but that's like life itself when you think about it. You know what I'm saying? That's like life itself has its challenges, has its, has its risk reward, risk reward. But there's more reward for us to do the truth, you understand, than um, saying we don't want to deal with the risk, you understand, and have, and, and have the, the being persecuted you understand? Being persecuted anyway. You understand? Being persecuted anyway. But I digress on, on, on that particular matter. I, I, I think so. But let's go on to our divine heritage because here's what we want to get to in, in a little bit of time that we have in this video. Y'all, y'all got this right here, Ethiopia 9-7, Holy Covenant. We, we talked about days because this is, this is um, actually this is, this is Sunday. This will be Sunday evening. What, what people will call Saturday night, so to speak. This is Sunday evening right now, um, but it's still technically the 5th. So once again, happy Ethiopian, imperial Ethiopian um, Liberation Day, Independence Day, Victory Day, Cinco de Mayo, Yovas, um, to you all. Now let's, let's get into this right here. Let's get into this right here. Um, and what we want to touch on is our fivefold is the fivefold um, principles. We want to touch on fivefold principles right here with you for a moment. All right. Um, I, I'm looking at this order, and perhaps I I like to try to put it in an order. And I and I'm gonna go through what I have here, but I might reorder it up here. And this is like the fivefold principle of true Rastafari. The fivefold principles of true Rastafari that are in harmony with the teaching of His Majesty, you understand, know and with our Ethiopian um, witness, with, with our Ethiopic and Ethiopian witness, the teaching of His Majesty, the Word of the King of Kings, our our divine heritage. One, we put H I M. That's Haile Selassie the first. Kadamawi Haile Selassie. Or Moa and Bessem Negeri Yehuda, Kermawi Halaslasi, Siume, Egeziavi here, Negusim Neges, Ze Ethiopia. Right? Is our kinsman redeemer. Right? So let's just put this up here right now. We might reorder, reorder the order of this. But we put this up here in this order right here. One, H I M. Right? H I M. Kinsman, right? Kinsman Redeemer, right? Kinsman Redeemer. That's the first. We have regarded that as being one of the first, um, one of the first points. You know, one, 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 one of the core elements. H I M is our Kinsman Redeemer. Now, um, those who have been following the ministry and 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 the teachings. I think we talk about it a little bit in this book one right here, um, the Gospel of Him, Haile Selassie, first book one. We speak about this um, somewhat, but we want to expand a little bit more on that connection with our kinsman redeemer. But it's mainly referring to the word of Reverend um, James Morris Webb. Reverend James Morris Webb. It's from him that we get the um, look to Ethiopia where a black man will be crowned king, in him you will find the Redeemer. This is a page here. I don't know if you can see. This is, this is the brother right there, James Morris Webb right there, Rabbi Arnold Ford who wrote the Ethiopia Anthem, um, uh, Crowdy, um, one of the first of the Hebrew Israelites, um, congregations, and this brother right here, um, Rabbi Wentworth Arthur Matthew of the Commandment Keepers Congregation, one of the first of the Ethiopian Hebrew um, Israelite black black Jews of, of Harlem in America, but they call themselves Ethiopian Hebrews, and that's going back to like the the, the 20s and 30s. So this this ain't nothing new, like you know, like people say people making up stuff. You know what I'm saying? We got too much facts and evidence of our story to go around making up stuff. You know what I'm saying? There's too much evidence there to touch on and, and to expose and to show our people 
so they'll know the truth for themselves. So the first thing is, HIM is our kinsman redeemer. You know what I'm saying? That's based on that famous look to Africa, where a black man shall be crowned king. Now, this has to do with a certain time period. You know what I'm saying? Because prophecy and fulfillment of prophecy is all connected, you understand, with certain prophetic time periods. You understand? Certain prophetic time periods. Another reason why this book, The Witness of the Stars, and our introductory um, notes that we attach to our our reprint of this, this present um, edition of this, is very much, a, very much a key to see from a scriptural point of view that something, something very important was happening in eighteen in the eighteen nineties. You understand? And something very important happened in eighteen ninety two was witness in the heavens. We have this document from eighteen ninety three. And there's additional prophecies as well, which are touched on and alluded to. And if we study it for ourselves, I'm sure we'll find that there's also much more about this that's very prophetic. But we want to release this first and then do our own version where we break it down, go into a little more detail, Ja willing. Now, that's the first matter. So HIM is our kinsman and redeemer. Now, in the Hebrew, this is called the, the Goal, the Goal. Yeah, right? The um the Goal and the Gula, so forth and so on, but the Goal. There are specific scriptures that actually touch on what a kinsman redeemer is and why we as the once lost but now found beta Israel need it and why it's necessary for our freedom, liberation, our true forward movement to recognize and identify our kinsman redeemer. And without doing that, we may recognize that we're Hebrews or Israelites and, and, and the curses of disobedience and for We may recognize everything in the past, but we get stuck at the present and the future becomes spookism and make-believe. But if we recognize our kinsman redeemer in connection with who we are as Beta Israel and, and, and why that connection prophetically is important, we both recognize who we were, where we came from, where we're at, what we need to do, and what our written futures and blessings, you understand, which are part of our scriptural, biblical, and holy covenant, divine heritage, inheritance is all about. And then we can access it because as the scripture that we read, then we have, what does it say right here? Um, but as um, to them, but as many as received him, to them he gave what power? Sultani. He gave uh, authorization. Now, that same word authorization, I want you to compare um, John chapter, the Gospel of John chapter 1, where it mentions power, chapter 1 verse 12, where it mentions power, with acts of the apostles. After the, the, the crucifixion, the death, and the resurrection of our black Lord, Yeshua, Jesus Christus, Jesus Christ, He's once again asked about the restoration of Israel, the, the, the kingdom being restored to Israel. He's asked about that in Acts of the Apostles, chapter 1, verse 6. And when they therefore were come together, they asked him, saying, Lord Adoni, Master, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? So they were concerned with the fact that they did not have that kingdom. Um, understand how important this is and the connection with Hala Salas, the connection with Ethiopia, the connection with the Davidic monarchy that is, that is evident here. You understand? They asked him after the crucifixion. They didn't ask. Listen, if they were like the, 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 the churchens and the Christians today, they will have been saying, wow, Lord, how you resurrect, man? I saw you dead. I heard you was dead. You got up. Well, I mean, what? I mean, I know Paul, God, but wasn't that, I mean, where did you go? So, I mean, you've been asking other questions. But they were saying, all right, cool, you conquered death. All right, we get that. But, but, but when are we going to have our Davidic kingdom again? When are we going to be a sovereign people? That's what they was asking when they asked, um, wilt thou, wilt thou, will you, at this time, right now, that means 2,000 years ago, will you at this time restore again the kingdom, the kingdom to Israel? But now hear what Yeshua, hear what Adonenu, 
our black Lord says to them. He says, and he said to them, it is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Abba, which the Father in translation, but the Abba, the Afro-Shemitic word meaning Father, which the Ab hath put in his own power. That's interesting. That word power right there in Acts of the Apostles 1 and 7, the same word power there, if you study it, is the very same word power in John's Gospel 1 and 12. And now what do we define that as? That power means authority, sultani. So the Father, he's saying, Christ is saying, listen, you know, I am the Bain Ha Elohim. I am the Son of Elohim, of the true God, Father. And he has authority in his own hands as the Father. I'm coming bearing witness of certain things to get you prepared. You know what I'm saying? Get you prepared for that day. So they want to know, is it now that we're going to have the kingdom again? Because remember, they still are looking in terms, the political terms of their time, like a lot of us as blacks too. You understand? Know what is Obama going to do? What's going to happen in 2012? You understand? Know what, you know, so forth and so on. We're still looking in the political terms of the world view. So they were looking at the Moshia and saying, have you come to reverse our political, our social situation? Because, you know, we're in a bad way politically. Those Romans and everybody taking advantage of us. They got kings and everything. And then we're here like a, you know, like a, a second-class citizen, like an occupied nation. So are you going to restore the kingdom to us so we can exercise those royal prerogatives? And what does Christ say to them? He says, it's not for you to know this, but, you know, know the times or the seasons. Now, see, the word times and seasons are significant, too, as we've touched on before. Whenever you hear times and seasons in the biblical context, it is speaking, first of all, in the context of, of the Hebrew the Hebrew revelation and the Hebrew holy days, or what we call the Moedim, times and season. And it also is connecting with the witness of the stars. You understand? With the witness of the stars. So when it says there are times and seasons which the Father has in his own authority, and that is not what you're supposed to be worrying about right now. But it's, it's interesting that the Israelites of that particular time even though one who did so many miraculous and great things, according to the witness here, the Bible, you know, they are still worried about a political thing like when are we going to be sovereign? So what was his further answer to that? His further answer to that in verse 8, he says, but, and here's what he gives them, they say the apostolic commission, he says, but ye shall receive power. Now, Here's what's interesting. That power in Acts of the Apostles 1 and 8, excuse me, is a different power. It's not Sultan. It is Chayil. You understand? It is not, it is not um, Exousia. I think Exousia in the Greek, it is Deutimus. It is Deutimus sort of power. It's like, it's like an overpowering, a, a force power, not an authorization power. You know what I'm saying? So it's interesting that as you're reading this in the English, You'll see power in verse 7, Acts chapter 1, and you'll see power in Acts chapter 8. And most folks would think, I mean, I mean, how are they supposed to think any differently unless one, unless one guides them, as the Ethiopian eunuch said. They would think that both powers are the same power. I'm going to check it out. It's not the same power. And you can go study the, study the Septuagint. If you do a simple Septuagint study on these two verses and look at the word for power in verse 7 of Acts chapter 1. Look at the word for, for power in John's Gospel chapter 1 verse was at 12. And then look at the word for power in Acts of the Apostles chapter 1 verse 8. And the interesting thing you'll find out is that John chapter 1 and 12 and Acts chapter 1 and 7 agree in the word for power, and the word for power in Acts chapter 1 and 8 is a different sort of power. So when he's talking about this sultane, right, right, the sultane, the first sultane that they're to receive is the sultane to become the sons of God. 
right? They are asking about the Sultane to be the Davidic kingdom, to be basically, you know, we, we always talk about every, you know, we're, we're kings. We come from kings. All of us were kings before. All of us were kings and queens. And I'm saying, how long is all people going to believe that nonsense? Yeah, some of us, we had kings and queens before as black people, as Ethiopian, as Hebrews. But we all wasn't kings and queens. But you hear some of these, some of these teachers and, and these other so-called um, teachers, you know, people out there in the Afrocentric kind of thing. We all were kings and queens. And that's what we have to get to again. Because we all are kings and queens. All of y'all are kings. And, and that's why no work can get, all, get done. That's why the movement in the state of inertia. You see what I'm saying? So, um, you know, something to think about right there. We're always in kings or queens, but in a sense, that's what they're asking. Christ, he, he, he shuts down the, the sultane of the kingdom, the restoration of the kingdom to Israel, so that this is in the hands of the Father, which shows that it was not his role or responsibility, according to our divine heritage, for Yeshua, for Jesus, for Jesus to restore the kingdom to Israel, but it is in the authority of his father, our father, Kedusa Abatachin, to restore the authority in his time and in his season. So we have two kinds of authority we need to do. It. The first one is the authority to become the sons and the daughters. You see, and that connects with Joel, where it's all about the he will pour out his spirit upon the sons and the and the daughters, and 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 so the pouring out is a connection with this 2012 and this so-called age of Aquarius, because Aquarius is pictured as the water bearer, male or female, according to how people see the stars. You know, but but it's pouring out water, pouring out water, that pouring out sense. But in the same time, the Bible says there will be a time when wrath, when the wrath of the Lamb, the wrath of God will also be poured out on the ungodly and those who reject, you understand, this, this, this message so full of compassion. There will be wrath poured out on some and Holy Spirit poured out on others. Right? So just understand, so when we look at, well, what is this Aquarian age really all about? It's about the pouring out. But there's two particular kinds of pouring out. You understand? So really what you have to identify is, well, who are you and what will are you trying to fulfill? And if you're trying to do, do your own will, like do you, well, you're going to get the wrath poured out on you. You see what I'm saying? Especially after you hear these messages and hear many of these messages, if you decide, that means you willingly. You can't say, I didn't know about it. Nobody told me. Somebody told you. You knew about it. So it's time to decide this day whom you shall serve. But Christ says this to them. He says, but ye shall receive power, the, the deutimus power, if I'm correct there, the deutimus, like dynamite power, the hyal, the hyal power. After that, the menses produce the ruach ha Kodesh, the Holy Spirit, is come upon you, and ye shall be what witnesses to me, both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria, and to the uttermost parts of the earth. Verse 9, just to cap this section off, it says, And when he had spoken, when Yeshua had spoken these things, while they beheld, while they were, while they were looking, I could see they, they must have had their jaws dropped. Like, what? We wanted, the, we wanted the kingdom. And he told us, okay. It says, He was taken up, and a cloud received him, out of their sight, and a cloud received him out of their sight. Some it sounds very extraterrestrial. What you think that there's only extraterrestrials now because we get more evidence of it? There wasn't extraterrestrials in the past. I mean, how daft can you be? You know, I mean, how stupid can you be if you believe that, oh, there might be extraterrestrials now, and it might be a reality now, but it couldn't have been a reality in the past. Because you don't find no ancient writings where it says extraterrestrial. You don't find no ancient writings. You don't find UFO in hieroglyphics. You're too daft. You know what I'm saying? You should keep looking for it. You might find it. Anyway, secondly, secondly, right, the, 
the second matter that concerns us right here, right? The second matter. So the kinsman redeemer, the reason why we went on, on these scriptures right here is to connect H.I.M., Haile Selassie the first is our kinsman redeemer. And he is fulfilling the, the role of what is in the authority of the Father. You understand? In restoring the kingdom to Israel. Now, the first thing that folks will probably say, well, I hear what you're saying, but, okay, how Slotsy came at that time, and, and so where's the kingdom? He came and left, and where's the kingdom, some would say, right? Well, the kingdom, the kingdom is, is the Ethiopian World Federation. That's, that's, the, that's the access gate. That's, that's, but, but the only way you can enter in through the straight way is in our divine heritage. Unfortunately, a lot of people have entered in, in a lot of crook-hearted ways. You know, they've zigzagged. You know, it's like they fell in it. You know what I mean? Or something else like that. And you can see. That. Don't believe me. Don't accept my word. Judge them by their fruit. You know what I'm saying? Judge them by their fruit. You know, it's by what work. What are they farming? What are they tilling? You know what I'm saying? And how does it grow? Is, is it weeds? Or, you know, what comes up? Is it good fruit? You know what I mean? Are they building on the foundation? Or are they tearing it down? Are they with us? Or are they against us? Second point is that we are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Now, I said earlier that I wasn't too sure whether, you know, I, I was looking at this. I said, is there a better ordering of this? You know what I'm saying? We, we put on our list H.I.M. our kinsman and Redeemer, these five soul points. Right? Well, we are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Let's put this in right here. We, you know what I'm saying, are, right, the lost sheep, right, the lost sheep for space, I'll just put of Israel. Right? We are the lost sheep of Israel. Now, there's scriptures on that. There's historical records on that. We've pointed to things like Babylon to Timbuktu and a lot of the other reference materials that goes into, some of, some of them goes into exhaustive details, you know, that basically prove that. Some folks don't accept it and won't accept it, you know, but that doesn't mean it's not true. You see, remember, he's full of grace and truth. The grace now gives the opportunity to the truth. One don't want to receive the truth and act on it, then they fall from the grace and just like the devil who also fell from, from grace. All right? So the second point is that we are the lost sheep of the house of Israel. Perhaps this point might be better off as the first point, right? Perhaps this point, as it might dovetail um, with our divine heritage, because the verse that we put there was Amos 9 and 7. Um, an alternative um, rendering is Ethiopian, right? Hebrew, right? And that's as per Amos 9 and 7. And the other part of the divine heritage, we went into um, a little more detail on this particular verse, Amos 9 and 7. And if you read the whole chapter, not just being a one-verse Charlie, but if you read the whole chapter as we touch on the other context, it talks about the throne of David. It's all about the ruins of David, rebuilding that as it was in the ancient days and time. And that's what we have in Ethiopia. Well, that's what we should say we had in Haile Selassie's visitation. You understand? And that, that fateful Ethiopia, that imperial Ethiopia. Right now we have in Ethiopia and among many Ethiopians, willingly, unwillingly, knowingly, or unknowingly, is an apostasy. You know, the great falling away. Something that they've kept faithful to, or their ancestors had kept faithful to for, for almost 3,000 years. In a generation, they would fall from that. That sounds like a great apostasy to me. I don't know about you, but, you know, that sounds like a proof that it's not, and we'll prove that it is. That's the great apostasy right there. But, and that also explains another verse that some Hebrew Israelite brothers and, and, and ones out there would say, oh, we ain't Ethiopia. Because look, Ethiopia says in, in, was it, Zechariah? It says in Zechariah, is it Zechariah 2 and, um, 2 and 12? It says, ye Ethiopians also shall be slain by my sword. And they point that out to, to I and I. Well, actually, excuse me, not Zechariah, my bad, Zephaniah. In Zephaniah, Zephaniah 2 and 12, it says, Ye Ethiopians also 
ye shall be slain by my sword. The question I say, not even the question, but what I say about that, I say true, first of all, true. Our will and our main. You know what I mean? How many Israelites, careless Israelites, rebellious Israelites, was slain by the Almighty Sword. You read the passage where Yah says that he has put his sword in the hand of the Babylonians, and the Babylonians then use a sword against the disobedient Israelites who were fighting against the Davidic monarchy, just like many are fighting against the monarchy of Haile Selassie, which is the Davidic monarchy. Otherwise, if you want to exclude Ethiopia, you're forced, especially if you call yourself an Israelite, you're forced to prove where is the throne of David in the earth. I, I, mean, I mean, if you can prove some other throne of David, I mean, we're, we're, willing, to, you know, we're willing to debate that. First of all, we'll hear, we'll hear what you've got to say. And if you don't say Ethiopia, I mean, we know we're going to get a good belly roll out of it. I know some of you all talk about England. You understand? That's not the throne of David. You understand? Yes, there is Barit Ish. There's covenant people there. There's the black nobility there. But it's not the throne of David. They would like it to be, but it is not. You see, because when Haile Selassie visited, they didn't say, hey, you're not on the throne of David. We are. No, they bowed to the throne of David. You understand? That his majesty represents the throne of David. So, you know, you have to throw that one away. But this verse about the Ethiopians also shall be slain by my sword is just. You understand? Because it speaks for the careless Ethiopians as well. You know what I'm saying? And, and when you're, you're speaking about this area of Scripture, in Amos 9 and 7, it talks about a remnant. You know what a remnant is? A remnant means that there's a little piece left. There's a little piece that's good left. You know, so that means that if there's a remnant, there must be a, a, a whole bunch else that has been destroyed or lost or slain by Jah's sword. So what we're witnessing in this, um, in this creeping coup, this, this rebellion, this great transgression against the king of kings for almost 40 years is the consequence and the revelation of what that verse really says to the careless Ethiopians. You understand? But you can't use that one verse there. You understand? And dismiss all the other positive affirmative verses that there would be that remnant and Jah did fulfill and establish his prophecy there. You understand? Because look what Jah says. Aren't you like the children of the Ethiopians unto me, O children of Israel? We can say that based on that very same argument or word of Jah, he's saying that some of the Israelites who he views as Ethiopians are these very same ones. So if you reject the king of kings, you might end up on a part of being the one slain, even with that recognition of your Hebrew-Israelite identity. Something to think about. You understand? The, the time is short. You understand? We're trying to make this case for the kingdom because we want to get this old world system out of here. You understand? We want to preach the good news at everywhere possible to get this old king. That's what John said. John said, he said that the gospel shall be preached. No, he said this gospel shall be preached everywhere, and then the end of this, this um, Gentile world dominion will come. You understand? Some of you are keeping quiet. You must want this, this tribulation and persecution to go on. You understand? But be that as it may, that's your choice. You understand? Um, you can avoid... You understand your history and, and, and culture and this truth, but you can't avoid the consequences for avoiding it. Thirdly, moving on, thirdly, you understand? Thirdly, remember, we, we think that we might be about reordering this in a certain way, but these are, some, these are the five main points, is that, is that Jesus Christos, let's put it like this, Jesus Christ, right, Jesus Christ, right, is the way, right, is the way. You can expand on that trifold way, truth, and life. But we said here is the way to our Father's house or the way to Him's house. So, now, if we were to put this in better order, you understand, in better order, we would probably put this one first, right, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos is the way to God's house. Secondly, we are the Lord's sheep of the house of Israel. And thirdly, H-I-M is our kinsman redeemer. You understand? But these five still encompass, we see the fullness 
of Rastafari revelation in harmony with the teaching of the King of Kings and with biblical, scriptural, and reality prophecy of Rastafari in this present day and time. Fourthly, let's get through this right here. Fourthly, um, the meaning, the meaning, right, the meaning of the new name. By the meaning of the new name, and the new name being, not having space right here, but the new name being Rastafari, the meaning of the new name. The meaning of the new name. Remember, Jesus Christ, Jesus Christos, or the Lord, in the Hebrew prophet says, my name is continually blasphemed. You remember the portion we read in the other vid? Um, I think it was uh, Romans chapter 3. Let's just get this right here, Romans chapter 3. In Romans chapter 3, um, I actually, is it chapter 3? Uh, Romans chapter 2. Romans chapter 2, where he says in verse 24, um, Romans 2, 24, For the name of God is blasphemed among the Gentiles through you as it is written, that the name of God, is blasphemed by the Gentiles. And the Gentiles, for the sake of overstanding, would be the Anglo-Europeans, right? That the name of God is continually blasphemed among the Gentiles through who? Through us, because Paul is speaking to the Jews or the Ethiopian Hebrews, and he's saying because we did not stand for something, our ancestors, they fell for almost everything the Gentiles threw at us. And this is why we find ourselves as a, as a lost, once lost but now found sheeple in this particular situation, you understand, in this particular predicament, you understand, different than any other people's experience. They talk about America was founded by immigrants. I mean, and, and they'll say that and not even mention the fact that we were not immigrants. Because we don't really, we don't even matter that they'll keep saying that nonsense. You, you, you know what I mean? You get people who come from another foreign country and became a citizen, you know, the other day. You know, and, and, and when we're talking about what we're talking, that don't matter to them. You see? So we don't really recognize why, because we don't recognize our true name and who we are, being that lost sheep of the house of Israel, prophetically, Amos 9-7, being those Ethiopian Hebrews. You understand? Some religiously from a, a white Western uh, Christianity might say Jesus Christ, but they don't recognize the true humanity of Jesus Christ. And, and that comes as a cascade under that particular point, meaning his Ethiopianness or his blackness. That's not the all and all of it. You understand? But you've got to recognize his divinity. Everybody talk about, yes, his deity. You know what's interesting? As soon as you put a picture of, a, say, a black Christ or a black, a black man as, as Christ, you know, they have a bunch of pictures of white Jesus. It's all kind of goofy-looking sort of characters. I guess they'd be drawing themselves in a mirror or something like that. And as soon as you put a black man, you know the first thing they say? These black people... Are, are insulting the deity of Christ. No, what you're doing when you see Christ as he is, as an Ethiopian or black man, you know what I'm saying? You are basically insulting the deity of the white man. You're saying that the white man is no deity, but they try to flip the argument. You, you know, if you see Christ as he was in his true humanity as a black man, they're trying to say you're going against, you know what I'm saying? You're going against the deity. You see, because they, they, they really believe the lie. That's what it says, because they have no love of the truth. If they had a love of the truth, then they would speak the truth, they would be of the truth, and they would love I and I. But therefore, doth you know them. The fifth point is this. The fifth point, the fifth point is this. Of course, some are going to ask us, I know, uh, where's repatriation? Know what we say repatriation is? Repatriation is returning to the Father. And you can only return to the Father through Yeshua HaMoshiach or Jesus Christ. But the first thing, you have to remove the blasphemy. That means you have to understand the true, the true divinity 
his true word, and his true humanity. So once you recognize the true humanity of Christ is what we will call, for lack of a better, a better phraseology, Ethiopian Hebrew, or he was a black Hebrew, you understand? This, this specifically for the lost sheep, is, is very, very important. I mean, it's very, very, it's, 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 it's the key. And when they tell us it doesn't matter what color Jesus was, look at the hypocrisy. If it didn't matter what color Jesus was, why they got so many goofy white Jesuses? I mean, even in South Park, they have a Jesus. Yeah, people don't like it, but people laugh, people make money, it goes on, no big protests, so forth and so on. Nobody talks about them insulting the deity of Christ, but as soon as you preach a sober, coherent message of Christ, according to his divinity, what he did, you understand, who he is, how important his role is for all humanity, but once you say the key word, that he is black, then you've insulted the divinity of the white man. Well, insult away. You understand? Insult away. Because either, either you're going to allow them to blaspheme, blaspheme the father and son, or you tell the truth about the devil is a liar. The fifth point is the son of man prophecy. Quote, the son of man, right? The son of man um, prophecy. The son of man prophecy. Like I said, we don't have enough room right here. But the son of man prophecy fulfilled 18, 1892. Right, and once again, we gotta we gotta mention this particular book right here, uh, "Witness of the Stars." Check out our intro. You understand the introductory notes. You understand, but when you get into the text itself, the text itself, I think is um is 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 is, is self evident. You understand, this was this was the best manuscript that we could get of this particular book. We wanted to present this book, in a sense, as it. As it, as it was presented in 1892. And, you know, just thinking about that, first we were looking for this book and we didn't even know it was first, we thought it was first 18 and 1921. And then as we was reading it, we came across a particular area right here. And we just have to share this with you. And, and, and we'll sign off in this portion for now. But share this part with you right here. It was on um, where it said in the footnote, Right, with that footnote right here. There's a footnote. Um, okay, here it goes right here. Here's a footnote. And let's just share this. It says, um, Gotoma, when Christ was, when Yeshua HaMoshiach, the Son of God, the Bain Ha Elohim, right? Or what they say, Christ in his first advent, right? Born in, born in Beth, Bethlehem or Bethlehem, that there was a star. So, it's now been, um, I guess, confirmed based on historical records, eyewitnesses, and those who investigated that this um, star was actually a new star. That there was a new star and new stars. Well, let me just read it right here. Verse, uh, chapter, thir uh, not chapter, page 38. There can be little doubt that it was a new star. There can be little doubt that it was a new star, this particular star of the star of Bethlehem. In the first place, a new star is no unusual phenomenon. In the second place, the tradition is well supported by ancient Christian writers. One speaks of it, quote, surpassing brightness. Another, Ignatius, Bishop of Antioch, A.D. 69, says, quote, At the appearance of the Lord, a star shone forth brighter than all the other stars, end quote. Ignatius, doubtless, had this from those who had actually seen it. One named Prudentius in the 4th century A.D. says that not even the morning star, the morning star was so fear. It gets so beautiful in that sense, right? Or so bright. Archbishop Trench, who quotes these authorities, says, quote, This star I conceive, as so many ancients and moderns have done, to have been a new star in the heavens. Now it goes on right here, it says that one step more places this new star in the constellation that's known as Coma or Kama. Kam from Ham, Kam, Kemite, there's a link there. Ham is the prophet. And with new force, 
makes it indeed, quote, his star and the, quote, sign of his coming forth from Bethlehem. Now, here's a question that's asked. Listen carefully. Will it be, quote, the sign of the Son of Man in heaven, end quote, Matthew 24 and 30, when he shall, quote, come unto or come to this world again to complete the wondrous or the wondrous prophecies written of him in the heavenly and earthly revelations? Question. Now, there's an asterisk, right? There's an asterisk right here. You can see the asterisk right there, right? And then they got this footnote down here, right? And now this footnote down here was really interesting. I don't know if I paid attention to it before. I know the book is so much worthy in many different ways. I mean, in addition, but when we found this, and this link to Rastafari, uh, listen up. It says, quote, it ought to also to be noted, it ought, it ought also to be noted that in the preceding year, there were three conjunctions of the planet Jupiter and Saturn at the end of May and October and at the beginning of December. Now, I said, wait, when I first read this, I said, the preceding year, I said, what year was it written in? So when I, well, when I scrolled to the beginning, you know, the beginning of the, what they call like the title page, the title page of the book, you understand? I saw this down here, right, right there. I saw this down there. I was like, 1892. I was like, wow, it was written in 1892. You see that right there? Yeah, it was written in 18, I mean, 1893. 1893, so the year before was 1892. So I said, wait, he's saying that, let's see if we can digest this. He's saying that when Christ when Yeshua, baby Jesus, when Jesus Christ was when our Lord was born, when the Son of God was born, 2,000 or so years ago, there was this new star. It was called the Star of Bethlehem. Um, there are early Christian writers, ancient Christian writers, who wrote about this. We have Ignatius in 69 A.D., Prudentius in the 4th century, and others who spoke about this, this, this phenomenon occurring in the heavens, uh, a, quote, new star. And that reminds me of when, when Balaam, who, who was paid to curse Israel, could not curse Israel on Balak's behalf, but he actually pronounced a blessing about a star rising out of Yaakov or a star coming out of Jacob, thinking about that from Numbers for a moment. But then he says, well, this was a sign of his coming forth from Bethlehem. And then he asks this pivotal question. He says, Will it be the sign of the Son of Man in heaven? You remember, they said that there will be a sign of the Son of Man in heaven in Matthew chapter 24, verse 30. Then he, he, he notes down here in the footnote,